thanks. I am, I am very honored. I'm Rebecca Arbogast, uh, head of global public policy for Comcast, NBC Universal. And I am very honored to be able to introduce South Dakota's Senator John Thune, who just arrived by what sounds like was um, a bumpy air uh, travel. So we're, we're very glad he made it. Senator Thune is beginning his second term as chairman of the Committee on Commerce, Senate, and Transportation, where he's going to continue to play a pivotal role in many of the issues that we've been talking about here at State of the Net all day. The Commerce Committee, as everybody I think here probably knows, touches on virtually every aspect of the American economy. I mean, rail, aviation, oceans, fisheries, weather, everything. So um, it's, it's a broad remit that the senator has, but he has focused a lot on the issues of internet and digital policy that we're talking about today because he recognizes that it's the bedrock of the nation's 21st century economy. And he's, he's urged policymakers um, across both sides of the aisle to be quote, as nimble as our world-class businesses and our foreign competitors. As someone who hails from Murdo, South Dakota, which has a population of, I'm told, 482 people, he's an advocate for the, some of the issues that we were talking about in the last panel, which is rural access in areas so that they can continue to go forward and be part of the 21st century economy. Senator Thune has been a thoughtful leader, I think everyone recognizes, who has earned the respect of his colleagues on both sides of the aisle. And his legislative accomplishments should not overshadow the personal. According to Runner's World Magazine, he has the distinct honor of being, quote, the fastest man in Congress since 2009. <laughs> Senator Thune. Good afternoon. Thank you, Rebecca. And uh, congratulations on a, another great uh, State of the Net conference. And thanks to Tim for, for hosting us today. Um, Rebecca informed me that she summered, spent a summer in South Dakota, so I always recommend that if you're going to spend an extended amount of time in South Dakota, summer's a good time to do it. Uh, we're going to get about eight inches of snow tomorrow. But um, I do, and by the way, uh, being the fastest person in Congress, I always tell people is like, uh, it's kind of like being the best surfer in Kansas. Um, <laughs> It's a nice title to have, but it really doesn't mean very much. And, and, and I think Tom Cotton has probably uh, passed, that, passed that one up. But I do appreciate uh, the opportunity to be with you today. We're really, it's amazing when you think about it, starting the third decade uh, of the Internet. And um, it's no longer novel, but it's an essential technology that continues to transform the world around us, often in very unexpected ways. And I'd be willing to bet that people in this room back in the 1990s when we were talking about America Online, the World Wide Web, never thought that we would see combines and tractors, um, you know, built, having the Internet uh, operating within them. And it's really remarkable for those of you who don't spend much time on farms, just to see what wireless connectivity has done to farm equipment in making agriculture uh, much more efficient. In fact, um, if you get into a cockpit, or I shouldn't say you get into a cockpit, if you get into a tractor today, it's like being in a cockpit on an airliner. You have all these controls and, 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 and monitors and screens and computers, and it, it really is amazing. And it, it's transformed the way that we do agriculture in this country. In fact, um, right now we have sort of historic low commodity prices. We have high input costs, which narrows the margins uh, in agriculture. And so, uh, farmers need to be more and more efficient. They need more productivity. They need to really maximize their yields. And with the kind of technology technology that's available today, you can literally down to about a square inch of farm ground, determine how much seed to plant, how much fertilizer to apply, if it's irrigated, gr irrigated ground, how much water uh, to apply. And uh, it has made agriculture so much more productive. And it's going to have to be, because we've got 60 to 80 million people uh, that we're adding to the world's population every year, and somebody's going to have to feed them. There's only so much farm ground out there, and so the American farmer has to be more and more productive. And, and that's happening every single day. And agriculture is extremely excited about drone technology, because with drones, you can send uh, you know, a drone out and check crops, inspect crops, uh, figure out how much uh, weed control or pest control to apply to a certain field. Um, you can send out to look at livestock and spat livestock. There are so many ways in which uh, the, the technology that we're seeing today is benefiting our economy uh, all across this country, and sometimes in ways that uh, a lot of people perhaps don't even recognize. And then you look at health care. 
uh, it's remarkable in my state of South Dakota, we have a couple of large health care systems who are able to serve remote rural communities hundreds of miles away through telemedicine. And being able through a, on a video screen to do patient consultations to, uh, in some cases, when you have emergency rooms in remote areas of the state and they get a trauma case that's brought in to be able to consult with a specialist uh, someplace else in the state, it really is transforming the way that we can deliver health care across this country too. And uh, in enhancing people's not only convenience and not having to travel a couple hundred miles, but certainly saving lives at the same time uh, because of what's happening. As Rebecca mentioned, the town I grew up in um, is under 500 people. When I was growing up, there was about 800 people. So we're like a lot of small communities. We're even smaller. We're losing, we're losing a lot of population in rural areas of South Dakota. But the thing that's amazing to me about that is that when I was growing up, I literally, my life began and ended at the city limits of Murdo. You know, I mean, if we went anywhere, it was typically to Pier, the closest large town, 10,000 people, and, but they had a Taco John's and a movie theater, so all the essentials. But my dad, who was 97 uh, years old, still lives in the little town that I grew up in, in the little house that I grew up in. And of course, at 97, he doesn't have a lot of contemporaries still around, so he's looking for things to do. But because of the internet, he's connected to the world. My dad, you know, he cruises around websites and looks for news sources out there, and he emails uh, family members. Um, we've even connected him with Netflix. Um, I don't think he uses it much, but you know, there are just ways in which you, there are so many things that are transforming the way we live and in, in providing enormous opportunities uh, to people all across this country. These are huge changes. They're making our world better, more prosperous, and they're only made possible because of advancements in how data is shared and transmitted online. And that evidence, as I said, is literally all around us. By now, we're used to having at least a couple of uh, online devices near us at all times, computers, phones, TVs. But increasingly, we are seeing common everyday objects being connected online to a literal internet of things uh, that'll soon be ubiquitous. Things like thermostats, refrigerators, along with those pre precision ag machines and health sensors that I mentioned earlier. These IoT devices unobtrusively gather data and communicate with users and with other devices to solve a variety of consumer needs. The Internet of Things will also bring significant economic benefits and drive growth in every sector of our economy. There are currently about 16 billion um, wireless devices, Internet connected devices worldwide today and by 2020, some believe that number could grow to somewhere between 50 billion and 200 billion. According to McKinsey, the explosion of growth has the potential to create an economic impact of $6.2 trillion annually by the year 2025. And as much as consumers will see the Internet of Things uh, devices proliferate, most of the real benefit and growth from this trend will be seen in industrial, commercial, and civic applications. The IoT is just one example of how communications and information technologies like the Internet have become a fundamental part of our economy. There isn't a job creator in America today, I would argue, who doesn't have their own story to tell about how and when they realized the internet had become a critical part of their business. But while the connected digital economy is creating massive economic and societal opportunities, our nation's laws are not keeping pace with the rapidly evolving digital landscape. Over the last several years, Netflix and Amazon have completely disrupted the video world. The iPhone has just celebrated its 10th anniversary since redefining personal computing and connectivity. Yet most of the government policies dealing with video, wireless, and internet platforms were written for a world where none of these things even existed. It's a testament to the ingenuity of the American business person and entrepreneur that they've been able to adapt and succeed with laws that are increasingly out of date. Now, while I don't doubt that they can and will continue to work around the growing shortcomings of our nation's laws, American companies and consumers deserve better from our government. First, we need to modernize our communications laws to facilitate the growth of the Internet itself. And second, we need to update government policies to better reflect the innovations made possible by the Internet and other digital technologies. As chairman of the Senate committee, most focused on helping businesses find opportunities for growing worker roles and paychecks, the vast majority of our top agenda items fit into one of those two buckets. The Internet is the platform for learning, engaging, 
in creating in the digital world. And the more robust and secure our networks are, the more prosperous our country will be. Now, that means we need to both invest in America's digital future and make sure that the laws governing the Internet are well crafted. One way government can help investment in our digital infrastructure is by finding ways to make it cheaper and easier to build mobile and fixed broadband networks. At the Commerce Committee, I introduced legislation called mobile Na the Mobile Now Act to ensure that huge swaths of wireless spectrum are made available for commercial use by the year 2020. By then, we expect the next generation of ultra-speed, high-speed mobile services known as 5G, which will need way more spectrum than is available today. Mobile Now would also cut through much of the bureaucratic red tape that makes it difficult to build wireless infrastructure on federal property. And the bill would also facilitate inclusion of broadband-ready conduit in federally supported highway projects, reducing the time and cost of building out Internet service. Now, I expect the Commerce Committee to pass Mobile Now later this week. But this legislation is just the start of what Congress can do to promote network build-out. Even after Senate passage, I intend for the Commerce Committee to continue developing legislative proposals to spur broadband deployment, to make more spectrum available for the public, and to improve connectivity throughout rural America. And with Congress working possibly on broader infrastructure legislation this year, these kinds of ideas need to be a part of that discussion. Good internet infrastructure policies and investment matter very little, however, if government bureaucrats have the ability to overregulate the digital world. And when it comes to regulating the inter internet, one need look no further than the Federal Communications Commission. In a world that was turning away from legacy telecom services and instead toward dynamic internet applications, the FCC found its role in the world gradually, gradually diminishing. This is an in inevitable and good byproduct of a more competitive world brought about by technological innovation and successful light touch policies. Yet over the last several years, the FCC pursued an aggressively activist and pardon, partisan agenda that put government edicts ahead of real consumer desires in setting a course for the internet. Now, speaking about new economic opportunities on the internet, the last FCC chairman declared that, and I quote, government is where we will work this out, end quote. Now I don't know about you, but I think the marketplace should be the center of the debate over how our digital networks will function, not the FCC. And I believe consumers and job creators should be the ones deciding about new technologies, not the government. For instance, some internet providers are offering plans now, service plans, that allow you to stream video, music, or other content for free. These innovative offers are a sign of a dynamic and aggressive competition in the marketplace. Yet two weeks ago, the outgoing FCC issued a report raising what they called, and I quote, serious concerns that such practices likely harm consumers, end quote. They seem to think that being able to do more online for less money is a bad thing for consumers. Well, it seems like consumers have come to a different conclusion because uh, the free data offerings are turning out to be quite popular. One of the important takeaways from November's historic election is that the American people are tired of government bureaucrats trying to micromanage their lives. And one way for us to address this concern in the digital space is to both modernize how the FCC operates and reform what the FCC is allowed to do. We need a modern regulator that focuses more on fixing fundamental problems in the marketplace and focuses less on dictating direction of technological innovation and progress. The last time Congress passed meaningful laws affecting the FCC was in the mid-1990s when the Internet was just in its infancy. It's clearly time for FCC reform. Now, we've had many conversations about improving the agency, and this year presents a real opportunity to turn those conversations into solutions. Given the broad interest in promoting continued growth of the Internet, I'm confident that we can attract the bipartisan support needed to move legislation modernizing the FCC across the Senate floor. Another area where I'd like to achieve bipartisan agreement is on legislation to protect the open Internet. We need clear and reasonable rules for the digital road that Internet companies, broadband providers, 
and end users can easily understand. Con or I should say complex and ambiguous regulations that shift with the political winds aren't in anyone's best interest. For people to get the maximum benefit possible from the internet, they need certainty about what the rules are and most importantly what the rules will be in the coming years. And the only way to achieve this is for Congress to pass bipartisan legislation. I've worked with my colleagues over the past two years to find a legislative solution. And while we haven't gotten there yet, I remain committed to the cause. Who knows? The reality of a Republican FCC may help inspire some of my Democrat colleagues to embrace the idea that a bipartisan legislative solution is the best possible outcome. And for those of you who have heard me uh, speak about these issues since I became chairman of the Commerce Committee two years ago, hopefully some of this sounds familiar. The committee was incredibly productive last year with 60 measures signed into law. We also made real progress on internet-focused legislation, including committee approval of the Mobile Now legislation I mentioned earlier and the first FCC reauthorization bill in a quarter century. We are going to build on that foundation in this Congress. So just to reiterate, my goals for this current Congress include enacting Mobile Now, moving additional legislation on broadband, broadband deployment and spectrum policy, including broadband in any larger infrastructure package, finding a long-term legislative solution to protecting the open internet, and working with my colleagues in the Senate and the House on overdue updates to modernize the FCC and our communications laws. In all of this, I want to take advantage of the good ideas that are out there from our committee members on both sides of the aisle and the stakeholders who are represented here today. If anyone has watched the two confirmation hearings that we've held so far this month for Elaine Chow to be the Secretary of Transportation and Wilbur Ross to be the Secretary of Commerce, you'll no doubt appreciate that Spectrum, the Internet of Things, cybersecurity, and broadband deployment, particularly in rural areas, were consistent themes from senators on both sides of the aisle. In other words, there will be no shortage of ideas to incorporate as we move forward on the goals that I've outlined. <clears throat> it's also important to underscore that, and as, as this group knows well, there is not a bright line between internet policy and the other key parts of our economy. <clears throat> the same is true of the Commerce Committee's agenda. For example, self-driving vehicles will be one of the most significant areas of oversight in the new Congress. And I use the term self-driving vehicle instead of autonomous vehicle because as my colleague from Michigan, Senator Gary Peters, has pointed out, you still have to tell the vehicle where to tell you, or where, where to take you, I should say. The term autonomous makes it sound as if the vehicle doesn't really need you anymore. But since 1946, more than 30,000 people have died every single year on the roadways in the United States. And over these 70 years, we've certainly saved lives by introducing seat belts and, and airbags and, and other smart uh, designs in our vehicles. But all of these important safety advancements pale in comparison to the potential safety benefits of self-driving vehicles. It won't come all at once, but self-driving technology has the potential to give road safety a record that competes with that of modern commercial airlines. Some have argued that self-driving cars or at least certain functions should be disconnected from the internet to minimize the risk of malicious hacking. But there are some obvious benefits to cars that can communicate with each other or with the infrastructure or can simply download the latest information about traffic conditions or updates to the vehicle's operating software. So conversations about the speed and security of our internet connections will be intertwined with discussions about the safety of our roadways. At the Commerce Committee, we don't guide new technologies. We instead allow technologies to guide us to the policies that are needed. At the end of the day, it will be American innovators and entrepreneurs who will determine what the digital future holds, not us. And we know that. The best that government can do is to try to facilitate their success while making sure that we are not accidentally standing in their way. If youth is all about endless possibility, then adulthood is all about manifesting that potential into reality. And as the internet matures now into its 20s, 
I am excited to watch how it and other emerging technologies will continue to change our world in the coming years. And as a leader in the Congress, I'm eager to do my small part in ensuring that all Americans benefit from these amazing advances. Thank you all very much, and we'll look forward to seeing you around the neighborhood. Thanks. No, no, you're good. You're good, Senator. Uh, we'll be, um, we'll, everybody follow the Senator. Uh, there's drinks in the next two uh, rooms uh, past there. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, there'll be cocktail bars in the next room and the room after that. Please stay. Thank you. <laughs>